Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to discuss functions of operators in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Operators are used to describe a wide range of properties in quantum mechanics. For example, Hermitian operators are used to describe physical observables like the position or the momentum of a particle. And as another example, Unitary operators are used to describe physical processes such as spatial translations or time evolution. But an important insight is that we usually find functions of operators when we work with quantum mechanics. For example, the translation operator can be written as an exponential function of the momentum operator. In this video, we'll learn what we mean by a function of an operator. In some ways, they behave like the functions of scalar variables that we're familiar with, but in other ways, they behave very differently. So we need to learn how to properly work with them to avoid any pitfalls. Let's go. An operator A acts on a state psi to give a new state psi prime. In quantum mechanics, we work with linear operators whose action on a linear superposition of two states is equal to the action on the first state plus the action on the second state. In this expression, C1 and C2 are complex scalars. Another important point for today's discussion is that the product of two operators A and B is defined by its action on a ket, and this expression means that we first act with B on psi which gives a new state phi, so that we end up with a phi, and then the action of a on phi gives another state chi. Now this is just a quick reminder, you can find all the details about this in our video on operators linked in the description. Linear operators are extremely important in quantum mechanics. For example, Hermitian operators, which are equal to their adjoint, are used to describe physical quantities such as position, momentum, or energy. As another example, unitary operators, whose inverse is equal to the adjoint, are used to describe a range of processes such as time or space translations. Again, you can find a lot more detail on all these concepts by following the links to the corresponding videos in the description. In quantum mechanics, we very often encounter functions of operators. For example, the kinetic energy of a particle of momentum p is equal to this, which includes the square of the momentum operator. So the function here is the power function. As another example, the time evolution operator in a conservative system can be written as this exponential of the operator h, which is the operator associated with the total energy of the system and is called the Hamiltonian. This expression involves the exponential function. The objective of this video is to understand what we mean by expressions like these. What are functions of operators and what are their properties? The key building block of all our discussion today is the power of an operator. We can easily define the power n of an operator as the application of this operator n times, so that there are n terms here. What we'll see in the rest of the video is that we can build more complex functions of operators, such as the exponential function, by simply using this expression for the power of an operator. We're now ready to define the function of an operator. Consider a function f of some variable z. We also consider the power series expansion of this function, where the fn are the expansion coefficients. We next define the function f of an operator a as equal to the same power series, and we're using the same expansion coefficients here, but now we have the powers of the operator a here. And this is all we need to work with functions of operators. Now, whenever we write a power series, there is always the question of convergence of the series. This is actually something that we will not consider further, because most functions that we need in quantum mechanics are well behaved from this point of view, so convergence is a topic we don't typically have to worry about. Moving on, as an example, we can consider the exponential function. The exponent of a variable z can be written as this power series, and we can also write out the first few terms explicitly. We then have that the exponential of an operator a is given by the corresponding power series with the same expansion coefficients, and we can also write out the first few terms explicitly. This is really all we need to work with functions of operators. What we'll do in the rest of the video is to explore some general properties of this definition. 
we'll find that some things work as you would expect for functions of scalar variables, but some things work differently, and it is important to be aware of potential pitfalls. Let's first look at a potential pitfall. Let's start with scalars. We can write that the product of two exponentials is equal to the exponential of the sum. What about operators? It turns out that this formula is in general not true for operators. To see this, let's start with the left-hand side. Using the power series definition, we get the expansion of the first exponential times the expansion of the second exponential. Writing out the first few terms, we get this for the first exponential and this for the second. Multiplying through, we get the power zero term, the power one terms, the power two terms, and so on. By comparison, let's consider the right-hand side. We again write down the power series. Explicitly, the first few terms are these. And we can simplify this expression to get the power zero term, the power one terms, the power two terms, and so on. Comparing the two expressions, we see that the power zero terms here and here are the same. The power one terms are also the same here and here, but the power two terms are not the same because in general 2ab here is not equal to ab plus ba here. These two terms are only the same if a and b commute, but we know that for operators a and b may not commute. This means that in general, this relation up here for operators is an inequality. Let's make some room. The general expression to combine exponentials is actually known, and is called the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. The proof is not particularly enlightening, so I won't prove it here, I will simply state the result. If you're curious about the proof, I'll leave a link in the description for a reference where you can find it. The general formula is that the exponential of a times the exponential of b is equal to the exponential of c, and c is given by a long series whose first few terms are these here. What we can see is that if a and b commute, then we can write an expression equivalent to that for scalars. However, if a and b don't commute, then this is no longer true. Now this is just an example, but it is an important one because it highlights that when we work with functions of operators, we need to be very careful. Many of the formulas that we're familiar with when working with functions of scalar variables do not carry through to the case of operators, so we need to be aware of potential pitfalls. Next, let's consider Hermitian operators. If a is a Hermitian operator, can we say anything about a function of a? To figure this out, let's consider the conjugate of f of a. Writing the power series for the function, we get this. This is simply the adjoint of a sum, so it is equal to the sum of the adjoints. And in this step, I've used the fact that the adjoint of a scalar is its complex conjugate here. Here we have the adjoint of a power, and we know that the adjoint of a product reverses the order of the terms, but as we only have the operator a in the power, we can simplify this expression to this sum. Finally, if a is Hermitian, we can replace a dagger with a to get this. So what do we have here? We can see that this expression almost looks like the function f of the operator a but not quite, because these expansion coefficients appear as the complex conjugates of the original ones. This means that in the most general case, the function of a Hermitian operator is not Hermitian. However, very often we're interested in real functions f, for example the exponential function we were discussing earlier. If a function f is real, then its expansion coefficients fn are all real numbers. In this case, we can now write the adjoint of the function, as equal to the latest expression we got, but now using the fact that the fn are real, we have been able to remove the complex conjugate from this term, and it is now equal to f of a. Overall, this means that if f is a real function, and a is a Hermitian operator, then f of a is also a Hermitian operator. 
Next, I want to consider the eigenvalue equation. Let this be the eigenvalue equation for operator A, where as usual the lambda i are the eigenvalues and the ui are the eigenstates. To explore what this means for a function of a, let's consider f of a acting on an eigenstate of a. We insert the power series definition of f of a, all acting on the eigenstate of a. Each a acting on ui here is an instance of the eigenvalue equation for a, so overall we extract the eigenvalue n times, multiplying the eigenstate. This means that we can rewrite this power series in terms of the eigenvalues, acting on the eigenstate. This here is simply the function f of the eigenvalue, so we end up with this. So what does this mean? If ui are the eigenstate of an operator a, then looking here and here, we see that they are also the eigenstates of any function of that operator. And if the lambda i are the eigenvalues of an operator a, then the eigenvalues of a function of the operator are simply the same function of the eigenvalues of the original operator. We're next going to look at a series of relations involving commutators of functions of operators. As functions of operators are defined through their power series, then we first need to consider the commutators between powers of operators. The first case is trivial the commutator of an operator A with the power of A. Writing it out, we get these two terms. We can collect the powers like this, and we get zero. This means that the commutator of an operator A with any function of the operator is equal to zero. For the second case, consider two different operators A and B, but we assume that they commute. The commutator of A with the power of B can be spelled out like this, and as a and b commute, we can rearrange this expression to this, and overall we get zero. In turn, this means that the commutator of an operator a with any function of another operator b that commutes with a is equal to zero. For the third case, let's first make some room. We now consider the general situation when a and b don't commute. Unlike the two cases we already looked at, in this case, evaluating commutators involving powers of operators does not lead to nice expressions. However, there is a very important special case, and this is what we'll look at. We're going to limit ourselves to the situation when A commutes with the commutator of A and B, and B also commutes with the commutator of A and B. This means that even though A and B don't commute, they each commute with their commutator. Now at first sight this special case may appear somewhat random, but it turns out that it is a very important case because it is true for the position and momentum operators. X and P don't commute, but the commutator is simply the scalar IH bar. This means that X commutes with the commutator of X and P, and the same goes for P. So whatever we learn for this special case will immediately apply to the position and momentum operators. In this special setup, the commutator of A with the nth power of B is equal to n times the commutator of A with B times B to the power of n minus 1. What I want to do next is to prove this relation. The proof is by induction. Any proof by induction has two parts. The first part is that if we assume that the relation is true for n, then this implies that it is also true for n plus 1. To see this, let's write the commutator of a with b to the power n plus 1, and the first step is to separate the second term like this. From the video on commutator algebra, we know that we can write the commutator of x with yz as equal to this term plus this term. Using this result, we can rewrite our expression into this first term, plus this second term. Now feel free to stop here for a moment to make sure that you're happy with this step. Moving on, this here is simply the expression for the value n that we're assuming to be valid up here. 
So we can therefore insert it to obtain this for the first term. And we still have the same second term. For the next step, we need to remember that we're working in the special case where b commutes with the commutator of a and b. So this term commutes with this term. And we can exchange their order to rewrite the first term like this. And we still have the second term. Finally, we can take out a common factor and we end up with n plus 1 times the commutator times b to the power n. So this is the first part of the proof by induction. We have confirmed the step up here. Let's make some room. The second part of the proof is easier. All we need to show is that the relation is true for the first few values of n. For n equals 0, for the left hand side we have this commutator, it is equal to this commutator, and every operator commutes with the identity. For the right hand side, as n is 0, we also get 0. This confirms that the relation is true for n equals 0. For n equals 1, for the left hand side we simply have the commutator, and for the right hand side we have this, which indeed gives the commutator. So the relation is also true for n equals 1. Now feel free to try a few more values of n, but you'll find that the relation does indeed hold in all cases. Overall, we've first shown that if this relation is true for n, then it's also true for n plus 1, and we've also checked that the relation is true for the first few values of n. Putting this together, we can conclude that this relation up here is therefore valid for any n, completing the proof by induction. Let's recap what we have. If a and b do not commute, but a commutes with the commutator of a and b, and b also commutes with the commutator, then the commutator of a with b to the power n is equal to this. We can now use this to calculate the commutator of a with a function of b. The first step is to expand the function in its power series. We then take the scalar expansion coefficients outside the commutator to get this. For this term here, we can now use the expression we derived up here, and doing so we end up with this expression. This commutator does not depend on n, so we can take it out of the sum to get this expression. And this here is now a power series which corresponds to the derivative of f. Just to be absolutely clear, I'm using this prime here to indicate that this is the derivative of f with respect to its argument. Overall, this means that we can write this commutator as equal to this other commutator times the derivative of the function of b. Let's finish by looking at a concrete example of this expression when the operators a and b are the position and momentum operators. We already explained that the position and momentum operators obey the conditions under which this expression applies, so all we have to do is to consider their commutator, which is equal to ih bar. This means that we can write the commutator of x with a function of p as equal to ih bar times the derivative of the function of p. Similarly, the reverse commutator is equal to minus ih bar, so that the commutator of p with a function of x is equal to minus ih bar times the derivative of the function of x. These expressions are extremely useful, and you can find an example of their use in our video on Ehrenfest's theorem that you can find linked in the description. In our study of quantum mechanics, we'll find ourselves working with functions of operators all the time. Now that we've discussed their mathematical properties, you're ready to see them in action. For example, you can check our videos on the time evolution operator or on the translation operator, both of which are given by exponential functions of other operators. And as always, if you like the video, please subscribe.